What's Welcome going on, everybody? To the guys, WWE bro, Podcast, back to another edition your number one source for the right latest on in WWE, WWE news and networks. straightforward analysis. As always, I'm your host, Mike Ritter. Get this thing going? Twitter, yeah. at Mike Ritter, yeah. Ritter, and on Instagram at Mike Ritter Five. On today's episode, we're going to be covering the SmackDown that aired on the Let's get this show started right now. And overall, this was a good episode of SmackDown. Uh, there was a lot of storyline progression, some in ring action, a lot of backstage stuff, a little bit of everything. Like they try to do on a weekly basis here in SmackDown. So, we're going to get into this SmackDown episode in just a second. But before I do that, I do want to give a quick thank you to Sean, who called in for the mailbag episode this past week. And he had some kind words for me, and I definitely heard that. So, I want to, you know, quickly say thank you, man. I, I definitely appreciate that. It means a lot. Listeners like you are the reason why I still do this show. I mean, just being honest, I, I enjoy talking about wrestling. But I, the main thing that I get from this is just being able to communicate with you and, and know that... What I'm doing here is being heard by somebody, you know, and for you to go out of your way to give some some positive feedback definitely means a lot. And, you know, and in situations like last week, you know, if you're not able to watch SmackDown, that's something that I take a lot of pride in is making my review feel like you did watch SmackDown and you be able to stay caught up with all the storylines and everything like that. So definitely want to say thank you, man, and I hope you'll continue listening to the show. So having said that. This SmackDown itself, it starts like normal with Roman Reigns. I mean, why would you start it any other way? He's the cream of the crop, so you want to get your viewers invested right away and let them know that you're going to get some Roman Reigns action. So that's what they do here. But before they show Roman Reigns, they show the video package, basically, of what happened last week between the Usos and the Mysterios. And Roman Reigns and Jey Uso are watching backstage in Roman Reigns' private locker room. And after the video package is over... You see Jay, he's kind of just sitting there, ashamed of himself for what the video package just showed, or shown, whatever, however you want to say that. I'm not on my A-game right now, so if I uh, if I slack a little bit this episode, hopefully you guys will uh, not hold it against me. But anyways, they're watching that video package, and Roman Reigns tells them that they're lucky that he interfered, and he basically saved them from losing to a child two times in one night. And that if Roman Reigns wasn't going to go out there and interfere, then the Usos would have lost to Mysterios. And, I mean, they are the tag team champions, so I guess you can't really slide them too much for losing to the champions. But if you're asking Roman Reigns, they have no business losing to a team like Rey and Dominic Mysterio. And then Jimmy Uso comes out to the ring, and we see him cut. It wasn't a long promo, but it was a pretty good one. He basically just says that, I mean, you guys all saw what happened last week. We got screwed out of both of our matches. First off... The referee called the pinfall whenever my shoulder was up, so we lose that one, and then we get a round two, a chance to redeem ourselves, and then Roman Reigns had to come out and make it about him. That's what Jimmy Uso said. So, I mean, I do think that they were probably about to lose if Roman Reigns wouldn't have come out, but I think that Jimmy would have rather lost like that. You know, he's still a babyface, so he would have rather lost clean than have Roman Reigns come out and try to save the day. And he alludes to the fact that he's done that their entire life, that he's always been this type of person trying to take the spotlight away and make Jimmy and Jey Uso feel like, you know, they're inferior to him. And then Jimmy kind of continues on by saying that what he did last week by knocking out Rey Mysterio and then choking out Dominic just wasn't right and that he didn't have to do it. So he adds before he leaves that he's going to do something tonight that he's not going to regret. And I was kind of curious by that. I, I was really going to pay attention to see what he was referring to whenever he said that, and to be honest, we really don't get a specific answer. Like, I'm not really sure. I mean, during the segment that I kind of alluded to a little bit ago, how I thought that the best segment of the night was the the last time we see Jimmy and Jey Uso, right before the main event, they have a little bit of a discussion or a confrontation with Roman Reigns. So, I mean, I guess maybe whenever we get there, we can kind of talk about if that's what he was referring to, because I do have a, maybe a theory there. But either way... It, it's something that happened early in the show that they knew that they wanted to keep you viewing. You know, they let they let you know early that Jimmy Uso was going to do something involving Roman Reigns and his brother that we really didn't know what to expect. I know at least myself, I didn't know what to expect here. So, I guess we're we will continue on because right after commercial break, because I'm pretty sure that they do go to a commercial after Jimmy cuts his promo. We come back from commercial break and we see Jimmy and Jay backstage. And Jimmy just cuts right to the chase by telling Jimmy that, or he tells Jay, sorry, that things have to change. He needs his brother to be by his side. And then Jay responds by seemingly 
hitting a boiling point, I guess you can say. And he kind of blows up on his brother. He just basically says, man, what do you want me to do? He reminds Jimmy that he's been out for an entire year. And during that year, his loyalty has changed. Jay's, that is. He says that his loyalty is now to the tribal chief. And then they kind of go back and forth a little bit. And Jimmy basically says, look, tell Roman that if he wants to see me, that I'll be in our locker room. Telling Jay, you know, that them two have a locker room, even though Jay is currently with Roman Reigns. Jimmy just kind of, you know, throwing that little shot in there, basically saying, look, man, you know where you can find me. So tell Roman that I will be there. And he does eventually answer that, uh, that little challenge or that offer that Jimmy Uso extended right there. But before we get there, we'll move on a little bit here to the first actual wrestling match of the show. And that is Apollo Crews and Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens and Big E. And this was, a, you know, a decently long match. Apollo and Big E had their time a little bit in the beginning, but I will say Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens stole the show here. I do feel like, and this doesn't happen in every match, it's actually something that's kind of a lost art in today's wrestling, but I do feel like Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens kind of told a story in the ring, just with their pure hatred and that type of stuff. I mean, you could just kind of tell with the way they sell their moves, the passion that they bring to the ring, it's just obvious, and I feel like they are, they're two of the best at that whenever you're talking about ring psychology, and they work so well together. So during the match, or at least maybe towards the end here, Big E went flying over the top rope to take out Apollo Crews, and that kind of frees up Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn to have more so of a one-on-one -on -one match in the ring, and Kevin Owens takes advantage of that. He hits a stunner on Sami, and he picks up the win. And after Sami, or Big E and Kevin Owens leave the ring, start walking up the ramp, Apollo Crews gets in the ring and he grabs a mic and he says that the only reason that they lost is because he was burdened by that idiot Sami Zayn, which Sami Zayn doesn't appreciate. But before Sami Zayn has a chance to retaliate, Apollo Crews adds that next week we will see if Kevin Owens and Big E have that same luck because they're going to have a rematch. Except this time Apollo, Apollo Crews' partner is going to be Commander Aziz who will actually be making his in-ring debut. I know he got some action there as Dabakato in the Raw Underground but this is apparently going to be his in-ring debut. So I guess we're going to see what type of big man WWE has on their hands here. I see more of an almost type of guy like who's going to need a lot of polishing. Is he you know, more of somebody who... I don't want to say he's up Braun Strowman's alley because obviously Braun Strowman was extremely athletic and like agile for his size and i don't see commander aziz being that type of guy but I, I mean i guess we'll find out i don't want to uh you know count him out before he even steps in the ring but before this is over sammy Zayn kind of climbs in the ring and says are you kidding me Did you just call me an idiot you, are you working with kevin owens like is this part of a conspiracy a conspiracy theory as well and he kind of continues on there even starts losing his breath a little bit i mean you know how sammy Zayn gets whenever he gets in these conspiracy you know rants especially after a match he's you know just already out of breath and he's just you know completely just killing himself trying to get this out but he doesn't have to do it for much longer because commander aziz hits him with a nigerian nail I almost called it a samoan spike there but he hits him with a nigerian nail and that's the end of Sami Zayn for the night so I mean I don't really know what you can expect here with Sami he's probably going to continue to linger around he, he even mentioned the intercontinental championship tonight or in this episode of smackdown so Obviously, that's still on his mind, so he's going to probably stick around here in this picture as long as Kevin Owens is going to be involved with Apollo Crews. So this is kind of just a big a big cluster of that mid-card talent that they really don't know what to do with. They're kind of just throwing in here in this Intercontinental Championship picture. So I guess uh, we'll see what they do next week, see if Sami Zayn interferes in that tag team match, but I'm more so looking forward to what Commander Aziz can bring to the table as an in-ring competitor, so... I guess we'll move on there from the Apollo Crew stuff, and we'll get to a little backstage segment here we got with the Street Profits. And Chad Gable kind of walks up here, and this I actually thought this was kind of funny, and this is the difference. This wasn't intended to be funny. It wasn't at all. That's why I feel like Chad Gable, I do feel like he has a little bit of that natural comedy to him, you know, because just the things he says, the way he, goes, he, the way he goes about it, you can tell he's actually a pretty decent actor. So, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that I noticed here in the show is that, I feel like they might have a little bit of chemistry there, the Street Profits and Chad Gable, because they're all kind of funny. And just a little bit of a side note here before I get into what actually happened here in this segment, because I know Matt Riddle gets a lot of, you know, attention for being like a public stoner. You know, it's, it's very known that he likes to smoke weed. I feel like Angelo Dawkins is kind of somebody who's going under the radar there. Just if you look at him, I mean, I don't know for sure. Obviously, the We Want the Smoke thing, they've been, you know, shown with RVD 
in the past. So I don't really know, um, like on air, they were shown with RVD and they kind of made references to smoke, you know? So, I mean, obviously, I mean, we're no, we're not idiots. We kind of know what they're saying there. And if you just look at Angelo Dawkins, I don't expect that he would actually go to work and go be on television high. But I mean, he just has that look. I don't know what it is about him, but I kind of just, you know, I noticed that for sure. I've noticed that in the past and I haven't really said anything about it. Just kind of, you know, brushed it off, but I noticed that tonight for sure. I was like, man, Dawkins looks like he just smoked a joint outside in the locker room. But I don't know. Back to the actual segment that happened here. And that is Gable kind of walks up and he apologizes. You know, hey, Otis gets a little bit overprotective sometimes, I guess you can say. And I can't really control his anger. I mean, I'm sorry, guys. But, hey, as a gesture, as a kind gesture, I went ahead and got our tag team match canceled for the night. So, you know, you're welcome, basically. And Montez Ford stops and says, whoa, 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 what do you mean you got it canceled? You know, do you think you're helping us? You're doing us a favor by doing that? No, you might not be able to, you know, handle Otis's temper. But trust me, we can. So, you know, they want to do it. And basically he says no, whatever. Or at first he says no. And then he says, you know what? You just talked yourself into another match here. So which one of you two want to go one-on-one with me? And then Montez Ford and um, Angelo Dawkins, they kind of, you know, go back and forth as to which one is going to actually accept the challenge. They both want to do it, but it ends up being Montez Ford. And this is where Chad Gable kind of adds a little bit of a twist. He says, okay, you can go one-on-one with me, but you cannot have Angelo Dawkins at ringside and I cannot have Otis at ringside. So it's basically just going to be a one-on-one match. And they agree to it. They say, yeah, you know, whatever, we're, we're down with that, so... Chad Gable starts to walk away, and he kind of looks back, and he says, but keep in mind, Otis is still angry, and then he just kind of walks away, so that kind of lets you know, all right, Otis is going to do something here, and I really didn't know what exactly Otis was going to do. I mean, I figured he'd just interfere in the match right away, and we will get to exactly what happens whenever that match comes on here in just a little bit, but continuing on backstage here, they go to Roman Reigns and Jey Uso who are backstage in Roman Reigns' locker room. And Roman asked Jay where Jimmy is. And then Jimmy, or Jay, sorry, I can't, I always get those two. It's just the names. I mean, obviously, whenever I'm looking at them, I can clearly distinguish who is who. But whenever I'm reading, you know, my notes here that I wrote during the show, and I, for some reason, Jimmy and Jay, there's the names. They're always, they get me twisted up here, but stay with me. Jay relays the message that Jimmy said earlier in the night about, hey, tell Roman that if he wants to see me, he can come to our locker room. And Roman just thinks that's hilarious. Like, our locker room? Like, really? You ha- you guys have a locker room? Like, yeah, that's that's hilarious. But, I mean, that's pretty much all they um they wanted you to get from that is that Roman Reigns is now aware that Jimmy Uso wants to see him and that if so, he wants him to go to his locker room. Roman Reigns does agree. He says, all right, I'll go, but it's going to be on my time. So... He still, I mean, he doesn't take that serious at all, the fact that they have their own locker room. He does. He continues to laugh at the fact that Jimmy Uso actually wants him to go see him in his locker room, quote-unquote. So that does happen, and that is the actual segment that I'm referring to. So I'm, I'm kind of teasing it here, continuing to tease it. We are going to get there, and I can't wait because that's one that, I mean, it, 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 had, me, it had me hooked. And for this Roman Reigns stuff being the best part of WWE in general, this might be one of the best segments that we've gotten from it you know yet or at least up to date so we'll get there at some point right now though we're going to talk about Carmella versus Liv and their rematch that they had and Carmella was actually introduced by the ring announcer as quote-unquote the most beautiful woman in WWE so I mean there you go they are embracing the fact that that's what she wants to be known as that's what she's going to be known as Strictly looks, even though she is pretty good in the ring, she's decent in the ring. I mean, maybe pretty good as a stretch. She has gotten better whenever she came back as this new gimmick and she immediately challenged Sasha Banks. I noticed right away that Carmella had improved in the ring. So, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have said that her in-ring skills aren't that great because maybe, you know, I was wrong there. But right here, she has a one-on-one match with Liv. Liv ends up winning. I mean, it's not a noteworthy match at all. Nothing really happens. Liv does hit the oblivion, gets the win. So now they are at one apiece. You can probably expect that rubber match to happen next week on SmackDown. Moving on here, segment three in the show. Because that's kind of, I don't really count backstage segments as segments. I count like stuff that happens in the ring. So technically this would actually be segment four. But anyway, segment three, four, whatever you want to call it. Ding dong, hello. Bailey has a special guest here with Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins comes to the ring draped in his like light pink 
to a lighter shade of purple. I couldn't really tell exactly what the color scheme was, but it was a badass suit nonetheless. So you guys already know that that's his gimmick, and I'm actually starting to really buy into it. I like what he's doing there. He's coming out every week wearing something different. Obviously, probably renting those suits, but either way, I just think he looks badass, and I hope he continues to do that because, I mean, those suits are pretty nice to look at, man. I mean, they're, I can only imagine how expensive those things are. Even to rent one, I bet it's very, very pricey. But anyway, here in this segment with Ding Dong Hello, they both kind of take shots at Bianca and they do kind of their obnoxious laughs together. And honestly, before I saw this segment, I kind of forgot how obnoxious Seth Rollins laugh is because he really hasn't done it in that long. He's kind of just been this like Messiah, serious, really, you know, I don't want to say mystical, but he's kind of like he's mysterious just because I mean, he always has that look in his eye that you really don't know what he's thinking or if he's going to snap at some point. Now, Seth Rollins in the authority on a weekly basis, we were hearing this laugh. So we could kind of remember like, oh man, like you don't really realize how annoying it was because we haven't heard it in years. But man, Seth Rollins definitely has that natural just nails on chalkboard laugh and him and Bailey kind of go back and forth. And one other side note here, I will say, I noticed that these two have some excellent hill chemistry together, Bailey and um, Seth Rollins. A couple years ago, they kind of forced Seth Rollins and Becky because they were a real-life couple to be a tag team, and it absolutely, like, it airballed. If it was, like, a basketball analogy, it did not work at all. So I feel like this one right here that they had with Bailey and Seth Rollins in the ring, I just kind of noticed, like, wow, they actually have some good chemistry together. Like, if they were to do an intergender tag team, like, those two as a heel team, I feel like it would actually have some success, much more than Becky and Seth Rollins had. But, I mean, I doubt that's ever going to happen. It's just something that kind of jumped out to me that, man, whenever you think about Becky and Seth back then and how awkward that was for Seth and Bailey to just kind of click, like, instantly, I just thought that was pretty cool. But, anyway, after they laugh obnoxiously about Bianca, they kind of turn their attention to Cesaro and then start laughing about what Seth Rollins did to him. And then as they're laughing, their doorbell for Bailey's set, how she has that door in the ring, the doorbell rings, and... Every single every single time that happens, my cat just g- gets up and looks at the door, I'll say. I mean, that happened this morning whenever I was watching and then last night because I kind of I watched SmackDown last night or at least a big chunk of it. And this morning I touched back up. I watched everything that I didn't watch and then touched up on the things that I wanted to for sure discuss with you guys. But every single time that doorbell rings from the TV, my cat thinks it's actually happening in real life and I just think that's kind of funny, but Cesaro is the person who actually is the one who rang that doorbell and the, is the one who comes out to the ring and he puts a beating on Seth Rollins immediately, destroying Bailey's set, ripping Seth Rollins' clothes off and he actually runs out of the ring and through the crowd, the um, virtual crowd, I guess. He runs through there in his underwear. I mean, she ri- or Cesaro rips off his clothes and absolutely destroys Bailey's set and then she gets in the ring obviously and visibly sad that all of her pictures and her door got destroyed and then you hear Bianca Belair's music hit she comes to the ring and then she has her own obnoxious laugh at the expense of Bailey so kind of just a little bit of I got you back there but moving on here we get a backstage interview with Rey Mysterio and he's asked to get an update on his son Dominic and Rey says he's hurt he kind of oversells how hurt he is, and we'll find that out a little bit later because Dominic does show up. But he makes it seem like he's laying in a hospital bed right now. And he says that no matter who you are, if you come after his son or his family, then he's going to go after you. That's what Ray Mysterio was saying. And then Ray says that his son wasn't injured by some freak accident or something that he couldn't or that couldn't have been avoided. He was injured by a guy who claims to be all about family, but will very quickly destroy his own and has no problem destroying his own. So Ray adds that by the end of the night, he's going to go out to the ring and call out Roman Reigns. And whenever he does that, he's going to see what family is all about. Roman Reigns is going to see what a real family is all about. So kind of just a little bit of a tease there to get you excited for what happens a little bit later in the night. Moving on here to another match, Chad Gable and Montez Ford. And they kind of have a little bit of a back and forth match. You kind of see Dawkins being shown backstage. And as the match kind of hits a stalemate, they show Dawkins one more time watching backstage, and then he's attacked from behind by Otis. An Otis who looks very different, I will say, and I'll kind of get to that here in just a little bit, because he actually looks like somebody from the Ruthless Aggression era. But anyway, Otis is, you know, he attacks Dawkins, and then he just 
as soon as he does that, it seems like he's making his way to the ring because he just has that look in his eye. I mean, he already took out Dawkins. And, all right, you know, we kind of set you up here. We, on purpose, made you have one of your guys wait backstage. And Otis bang, being backstage as well, I kind of told you, I warned you that he's still angry. You should have put the pieces together that he's going to come attack you. You didn't, so that's on you. And that's exactly what happens. Otis comes out to the ring. And he causes a disqualification to stop the match and prevent Ford from winning after Montez Ford just hit the splash from the heavens. So, after stopping the match, Otis continues to put a good beating on Montez Ford. Dawkins kind of limps to the ring and he's hobbling his way out there. So Otis kind of quickly makes light work of him, just throws him out of the ring. And then continues to put a beating on Montez Ford before Dawkins eventually just kind of lays just puts his body over Montez Ford to kind of protect him and, you know, to stop him from laying the beating on him. So this was a full-on heel turn. And this is definitely a heel tag team, you know, to the fullest. And I'm excited about that. I feel like Gable and Otis, maybe they might have something here, honestly. Because like I said, Otis ha- or Chad Gable has a little bit of that, you know, that comedy to him. And it's not being done intentional. So, I mean, that could be something that I'm just way off on. And it's just something that I think is funny. And Vince McMahon's like, what are you talking about? We're not going to make Chad Gable a comedy act. Even though they kind of have already with the whole Shorty G thing. So why not make it a little bit more serious here and have his... You know, his comedy wrinkle will be more so used in a hill way, you know, as like trying to get the upper hand to get under people's skin and set them up for things like what happened earlier tonight where Otis attacked Angelo Dawkins from behind. And I will say, Otis, what I was talking about here uh, a little bit earlier about him looking like somebody from the Ruthless Aggression era. Do you guys remember the tag team Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch? They were kind of portrayed as like redneck hillbilly type characters. You know, one of them was actually from Waxahachie, Texas, which is right outside of Dallas. So, um, who, which one, oh yeah, Trevor Murdoch, he was kind of the one that was a little bit more heavy set, and he just always had that pissed off look on his face, Otis, without facial hair, looks so much like him, and it immediately, as soon as I saw Otis, that's exactly what I said, I couldn't remember the tag team exactly, I had to go look him up, but right away I knew he looks like that guy, and it's sure enough, I went and looked him up, and there definitely is some similarities, and I want to see kind of where they go with Otis in this new look. I want to hear from him. You know, I want to hear an Otis promo now to see if, if he sounds any different, if his delivery is any different. Something that I could maybe get invested in with this new tag team. But I will say, though, just quickly on that tag team uh, from the Ruthless Aggression era, Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch. Lance Cade actually passed away, the, the one that was way more in shape. It was an apparent drug overdose, I think. And, you know, that's that's always sad with former wrestlers because I do remember he was a guy who had potential. He was extremely young whenever he came into the WWE with that tag team. And I'm not sure when. I think they I think they debuted around 2005 and might have left the WWE around 2008 or 2009. But either way, I do feel like they were a good heel tag team while they were in the WWE. They were on the Raw brand, so I got to watch them every single week. So definitely RIP to... Lance Cade, you know, you never want to see somebody who you watched, you know, on a weekly basis end up uh, passing away like that. It's always something sad, especially with wrestlers, man. It's the the older you get, the more and more names just get added to the list of wrestlers who are no longer with us. And it's sad. It's never something that, you know, I ever want to, um, I don't ever want to get used to, you know, I don't ever want that to just become a normal thing. But I'll stop talking about that. That's not what this show was about. So let's go ahead and move forward here. We get another match, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Baron Corbin. And I guess, you know, transitioning here into something that should feel like a joke because they're making us think it's a joke. That's how they're presenting it to us. I mean, this match was very fast. Rick Boogs was a constant distraction for Baron Corbin, as usual. And then Shinsuke does eventually win with, you guessed it, a roll-up. And after that's over, Corbin immediately loses it. And he attacks Shinsuke, kind of knocks him down. And then Baron Corbin and uh, Boogs kind of, you know, they make eye contact and they realize, oh crap, you know, it's like it's, it's like in a movie, like when our people are fighting and the gun drops and they both kind of look at each other, they look down at the gun, they look back at each other and they both kind of haul ass to the gun. That's kind of what happened here with Rick Boogs and Baron Corbin with the crown though. They both knew, oh, we got to make a run for this fake crown. We got to haul ass over there to the announce table and go get it. So that's what they do. Baron Corbin gets it for a split second, literally, because Shinsuke Nakamura takes it from him. And then Rick Boogs get the better of Baron Corbin for the second week in a row by throwing him over the announce table. And they kind of, Shinsuke Nakamura and Rick Boogs, that is, they have a little bit of an air guitar jam session to Shinsuke Nakamura's theme song in the ring. So, I mean, it is a joke. That's what what this entire program is. And we do kind of 
get that told to us a little bit later. Sonya Deville and Adam Pearce are shown backstage, and Corbin walks up furious, and he demands that Shinsuke returns his crown. Sonya's kind of laughing, saying, well, I, think, I think it kind of looks good on Shinsuke. You know, it's a nice little crown, and Corbin's just pissed off. He's like, are you kidding me right now? And Adam Pearce is like, no, I know this is a very serious matter. You guys both have two wins apiece, so how about next week we have you two fight for the crown, and we'll label it as, let me see that I get this right here. Oh, yeah, the battle for the crown. So that's what we're going to get next week on SmackDown is the battle for the crown between Baron Corbin and Shinsuke Nakamura. And I personally hope that the crown just gets destroyed. So the winner, whoever wins, doesn't get the crown. You know, I don't care what happens. If somebody interferes, I don't even know. If Baron Corbin just loses it and just destroys the crown himself. I don't really, I don't know. I just feel like they've made this feel like such a joke that I'm not invested in this at all. And it kind of sucks because I'm a huge Shinsuke fan. I, I have some, you know, some high hopes for Baron Corbin. I want him to go back to Baron Corbin. I mean, Pat McAfee literally called him Baron Corbin on the air, and he, he had to correct himself. He said, Baron Corbin, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean King Corbin. I was like, wait, what? Are you not allowed to call him Baron Corbin? So, I mean, that alone might tell me that they're probably going to have Corbin win and continue this King thing, but I hope not. Let's Let's get the crown out of here and get both these guys doing something different. But anyways, let's see. Before the commercial break, because they do go to one before things actually get good, Roman Reigns and Jey Uso are in Roman's locker room, and Roman has that, you know, that smirk on his face that, you know, whenever the last time we saw him, he was laughing, saying, you guys' locker room, you know, just downplaying the fact that Jimmy and Jay actually have their own locker room. So Roman says with a smirk, he says, all right, let's go to you guys' locker room. So they get up, and it goes to the commercial break. That was just a way of saying, all right, yeah, you're definitely going to want to stick around for after this commercial break. Because Roman Reigns is going to confront Jey Uso. Or, I mean, Jimmy Uso. Sorry, there we go. Did it again. But anyway, that's exactly what we get. We come back from commercial break. And Roman Reigns and Jey Uso go into Jimmy's locker. And once they get in there, Jimmy's kind of pacing back and forth. Obviously upset. Whenever they first go in there, it's Roman, Jay, and Paul Heyman. Roman Reigns asks Paul Heyman to hand him the Universal Championship. And then asks Paul to leave. He says he's going to need a minute. Paul leaves, obviously. And immediately Roman Reigns just kind of looks at Jimmy and he points at the Universal Championship and says, look at this. Like, do you understand? And Jimmy interrupts him right away and says, dude, I don't care about the Universal Championship. I don't care about what you're wearing. What I care about is what's in here. And he kind of beats on his chest and he says, I care about him. It's his brother. And he says, I care about you. But you've been doing all of this literally our entire life. You've been using us, abusing us. And I watched you do it to my brother for an entire year. And basically he says that Roman Reigns at some point is going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame as, you know, I mean, with all of his accolades, but very clear, very clearly, he says that he's not going to be inducted as Roman Reigns. He's going to be inducted as a spoiled, you know what? So I thought that was, I thought right there, I thought Roman Reigns was going to drop him. I thought he was at least going to hit him. I, I did not think that Roman Reigns was going to let him call him that and not do anything. But right there, Roman kind of starts playing the victim. He looks at Jay and says, you see what I'm talking about here? You see how he always tries to pull you in the middle, you know, and and do this. He remains calm. He makes Jimmy look like the one who's losing it, and he kind of just starts talking to Jay Uso. And that's whenever Jimmy chimes in, he starts talking to Jay, and they're both, you know, each in one of his ears are just going back and forth. I mean, any person would kind of lose it here, and that's exactly what Jay Uso does. So basically, Jay says, look, I'm tired of you, points at his brother, and says, I'm tired of you. And he points at Roman Reigns, and he walks away. And that leaves Roman and Jimmy Uso alone in the locker room. And I didn't know what to expect what was going to happen here. But what I'm actually going to do, and I don't do this very often, I'm going to provide some audio here. And you should be able to hear. I'm literally, my microphone is right next to my TV here. So I'm just going to hit play. And I hope that it'll be loud enough for you guys to hear. But I'm basically just going to play their encounter here, Roman Reigns and Jimmy Uso. Because in my opinion, I feel like this is where Roman Reigns finally went through to Jimmy. And I feel like this is where Jimmy it finally clicked in his mind that, all right, I need to basically, I'm trying to think of the exact word. But I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of exactly what to say here, but basically it's him agreeing. It's him finally just saying, you know what, you're right. I need to fall in line. There we go. That, that, that's the word I was looking for because everybody's asking, when is Jimmy going to fall in line? Well, I think this might be whenever that happens. So I'm going to go ahead and play this really quick. Oos! Man, you see what you did, Oos? You see? Now what? Now what, Oos? That's what I mean. You want to throw it out? Let's go. I'm tired of this, Oos. I don't care no more. I don't care no more. 
You want to box? Let's go. You want to throw? Let's throw. Let's do it. You want to fight me? For what? 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 What have I done? What are these little kids anymore? This ain't about being proud. This ain't about thinking what you want to do up here. This is our family business. This is our livelihood. This is blowing you up when you should be here. This is how we make our decisions. This is how we represent our family. Why would you do this to your brother? Your twins, yeah. Well, who came out first? Who came out first? So you're the older brother, right? Yeah. You're the older one, so you should be looking out for me. I shouldn't have to depend on him to reel you in. I shouldn't have to depend on him to teach you how to do it. You should just know I should be able to depend on you because it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about, it's us. It's all of us. And the only way that we can get it done is continue to be us and to be the best every single week. That's our ticket. That's all I know. That's all I've ever known is to be the best. And he kind of continues there. He goes on. I hope you guys could hear it. I know it was a little bit um, low of, in terms of audio. So I hope that you guys could hear. But I'm excited. I mean, you guys know Roman Reigns, he kind of talks quietly with this new version of himself. He kind of, you know, he'll be off mic and he'll kind of just say stuff. Sometimes I even have to, like, what, what did he just say? But... You guys got it there. I mean, he basically, I mean, if you can just look at Jimmy Uso's face right now, I have my TV pause. It just looks like it's working, you know I mean? And I could be, Jimmy could be playing us all like a fiddle here. You know, he could, he could easily just make it seem like he's buying into it. But I feel like Roman Reigns finally, he, he just cut the crap. He said, look, dude, I'm not going to play this whole little calm, collected dude anymore where you, you can make your decision to join if you want. If not, it's your loss and, you know, you're going to pay the price for it. He finally, you know, showed some passion, some emotion, like, dude, just hurry up and join already. You know, I mean, I, I liked seeing this. I really did. And well, I, the main reason why I wanted to provide audio is because I didn't want that segment right there to to basically just get swept under the rug for, for anybody who didn't watch it. You know, I wanted that one, and I didn't want to try to, you know, do a little bit of a recap of it and end up missing some stuff or just miss the, you know, how important it was. Because in my opinion, I feel like that was big. But anyway... We'll move on here to the main event, and it, it does involve Roman Reigns, this time with his Rey Mysterio angle, because like we said, Rey Mysterio was going to call, uh, go out to the ring and call him out and show him exactly what exactly a family means, so we do get to that. And it's right here, main event, Rey Mysterio comes out to the ring and call out Roman Reigns, and he calls him out, and Roman Reigns comes out almost immediately. And basically, Rey Mysterio tells Roman Reigns right off the bat, that he's going to acknowledge him. But he doesn't acknowledge him as the head of the table or the tribal chief. He acknowledges him as the rap bastard that he is and then proceeds to challenge him to a match not at Hell in a Cell, inside Hell in a Cell. So actually inside the structure, a program that had no legs under it, had no seeds planted that two weeks ago did not exist, is likely going to be inside of the Hell in a Cell now. I mean, take that for what it's worth. We already get Drew and Bobby Lashley on the Raw side. And a lot of people speculated maybe Seth Rollins and Cesaro. At worst, maybe Jimmy Uso and Roman Reigns. But now we get Rey Mysterio and Roman Reigns. So I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Maybe next week they'll do something to make it a little, more, a little bit more juicy. Because I know that's what they tried to do here in this segment. Because... Before Roman Reigns could even accept the challenge that Rey Mysterio laid out for him, Rey starts hitting him with a kendo stick, a pretty big kendo stick, I will say. This looked like it was, you know, worked to maybe be three kendo sticks combined into one because it was huge. And he was hitting Roman Reigns everywhere. I mean, he literally hit Roman Reigns like three or four times in the head, like no exaggeration. And Dominic eventually, you know, after Roman Reigns kind of Superman punched Rey Mysterio and he was about to spear him, Dominic comes out of nowhere, and then he hits Roman Reigns multiple times with the kendo stick, and he even hit him in the head a couple times. I was like, man, are they just like green lighting the old headshots again? But Roman Reigns eventually picks up Dominic, and it looks like he's going to powerbomb him inside the ring, but no, no, no. He runs to the stage side of the ring and completely just throws him on the outside of the ring. They don't show him land, so obviously he lands on some type of soft surface. But the way the camera angles were, they made it look like he just threw him on the ground. You know, he just threw him from like a 10-foot drop straight on to the mat outside of the ring. 
So that looked like it, um, it would have been painful if he definitely would have landed. They do show him, and they made it look like he landed on the ground. He's kind of just grimacing in pain. Rey Mysterio is over there trying to check on him, and Roman Reigns hits him with a big boot straight to the head, knocks him down. Rey, Rey Mysterio was doing some excellent selling. It, lo- it literally looked like that boot to the head knocked him unconscious. Obviously, it didn't, but Roman, or Rey Mysterio, he's, just, he's one of the best in the entire business. But that's how SmackDown goes off the air, was Roman Reigns just laying a beating on them and maybe the headshots they wanted to make it more brutal to make Roman Reigns more likely to accept the challenge you know you want to piss him off more if you poke the bear or if you wake the sleeping lion whatever whatever expression you want to say if you piss off Roman Reigns enough you're going to get him to accept it and if you want him inside of Hell in a Cell weapons are going to be legal everything's going to be legal so we'll see I do hope that I mean I know obviously the cell's going to be red but that's still that's that's one thing that I feel like that eventually they're going to change they're going to go back to the regular look, and I think they're going to look back on these couple years where they use that red cell, and they're going to be like, man, we were, we were stupid by doing that because that's just got to be one of the the dumbest things that they can do. I mean, I'm, I guess, you know, the, the, way they, the, the way that they changed the Elimination Chamber, I wasn't a fan of. I feel like the old structure was better. You know, it was smaller. It made you feel like they were actually in, you know, um, in something that could actually hurt them. Now it's, I mean, people have said it multiple times. They've... They baby-proofed it or whatever. I don't know if that was Matt or Anthony, Anthony DeMarco. I know somebody here on the show said that, and it's true. They completely ruined the Elimination Chamber, but at least it still looks cool. I, I'm not a fan of that red look on the cell. Just leave it silver, man. I mean, there's no, there's no reason to do that. But I hope you guys all enjoyed the show. I definitely enjoyed doing it for you. Looking forward to next week to see how these storylines get progressed some more. I know that NXT has a pay-per-view this week, if I'm not mistaken. NXT in your house. I'll probably be watching that. So it's going to be a a nice little weekend here. It's pretty hot here in Texas, so getting here into the summer, it's never never really a good time. I mean, yeah, you enjoy the summer, but, I mean, this heat is is no joke. And I know some of your your states probably get hotter. I know Arizona is way hotter than Texas. Probably Florida is way hotter than Texas as well. So I'm definitely not complaining by any means, just acknowledging that, man, not only am I a huge football fan, my birthday is in fall, so I love the fall, but... Just the, the weather. I mean, I'm not a fan of hot weather. I'm not a fan of, you know, really cold weather. So the fall, I feel like that's kind of perfect for me. Right before we get into winter, that that's just, that's my season. If I could pick a season, I would, I would do fall year-round. But there you go, guys. That's the show. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. hope you guys will all come back next week. And we will continue our path on to Hell in a Cell. So walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon.